this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're going to be looking at US Navy combat divers. The combat demolition unit would land on D-Day with the first wave of troops. It was their job to clear coastal defences that might get in the way of the landing craft. In the Pacific, the underwater demolition teams were carrying out similar tasks on island landings such as Iwo Jima and Okinawa. I'm joined by Andrew Dubbins. Andrew managed to track down one of the surviving divers who landed on Omaha Beach, then was shipped to the Pacific to land on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. His book is Into Enemy Waters, a World War II story of the demolition divers who became the Navy SEALs. Andrew, thanks for joining me. Um, before we get to US Navy combat swimmers, um, I'm slightly intrigued to know if if um, such a unit existed before the war. Was, was there is a is there a tradition in any Navy of, uh, of uh, combat diving? It was unprecedented when Draper Kaufman launched that Naval Combat Demolition School at Fort Pierce. It was the very first, and they were pioneering brand new tactics, underwater demolition and uh, swim reconnaissance. There had been some examples from ancient history that I list in my book, the Spartans, and some from the Italians. They were very cutting edge with these um, combat swim, combat dive teams in the Mediterranean, fixing mines to, to the hulls of British ships. But nothing like this had been tried in the US. It's amazing. I thought there'd be a whole uh, history of, of this kind of stuff going back for you know centuries. But uh, absolutely fascinating. So Drip Coffin, you mentioned him. Um, you know, he, he sort of is influential in setting up the unit. Who who is he, and what what's his journey into the U.S. Navy? Because it's not necessarily straightforward for him, is it? Yeah, a fascinating you know naval legend. His dad was a, a famous admiral, Reggie Kaufman, who'd been commanding destroyers, and Draper wanted to grow up just like his dad, command a destroyer. But he had terrible eyesight, so he went to Annapolis just like his dad, but failed to get a commission to pass the eye exam. So he had to pivot into the shipping industry. And then as you know, World War II was getting started in Europe, he volunteered to drive an ambulance in France and got captured by the Germans, went over to the UK and volunteered with a bomb disposal team, defusing bombs and during the Blitz. So he had a long war even before the US had entered it. Uh, in 41, he was called to Hawaii after the Pearl Harbor attack. He was the only officer trained in bomb disposal. And then the Navy looked to him to, instead of defusing bombs, using bombs to clear enemy obstacles. And, and that's the birth of this Naval Combat Demolition School at Fort Pierce, which eventually morphed into the underwater demolition teams in the Pacific. And he's looked upon as the father of underwater demolition. He's refused to be in the U.S. Navy, but he's, in, he's actually in the Royal Navy when he initially, isn't he? Right, because he couldn't get a commission in the in the U.S. Navy because of his eyesight. And when he finally got back in, it was his dad roamed in high circles and had Nimitz over for cocktails. And Nimitz said, what are you doing in a British uniform? He said, every time I apply for the U.S. Navy, they reject me because of my eyesight. My eyes aren't good enough. And Nimitz says, well, now they are, after he heard his track record. When, when, they, when he's brought in and he's starting this underwater demolition sort of unit. I'm right saying it, it, it's not initially an underwater demolition unit. He's, is he tasked with trying to work out the German beach defences and then they form the unit? Is that the chronology of it? So it, he starts with the naval combat demolition units in Fort Pierce, and their main objective was clearing the enemy obstacles in advance of our invasion of France and, you know, the Normandy German obstacles that you picture, the tetrahedrons and Belgian gates. And so that was their, his first directive and, and the focus. After the invasion of Europe, we no longer needed that specialty. So it moved to the Pacific and the underwater demolition teams. He then led the first major daylight reconnaissance of the UDTs. 
So they, they grew up kind of separately in the Pacific and um, Atlantic theaters, but eventually all the NCBUs moved into the UDTs. Now, and it's at this point, we said George Morton joins Kaufman's demolition unit that's going to go into, well, ultimately we're going to Europe. So who's George uh, Morton? How, how do you end up in a uh, naval demolitions unit? Yeah, he had a fascinating story. You know, a child of the Depression grew up in New Jersey and did a lot of odd jobs to help support the family. His dad had lost his job in the the great stock market crash. And uh, one of those jobs was lifeguarding. So he got to be a good swimmer, worked over the summer lifeguarding. So come time to volunteer for the Navy, it actually... Came down to the last minute because he tried out for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He'd always wanted to be a pitcher, and he even made a farm league and met Branch Rickey. And but the day after he got his letter saying you've been called up, head up to Elmira in upstate New York to pitch with your new team. The next day he got a letter from the Navy, you've been called to duty, son. So he did his basic training up in Sampson, New York, and then went to Fort Pierce, which we were just mentioning, home of the Naval Combat Demolition Unit for advanced training and he was sorted and an officer asked him or do you know how to swim he said sure i was a lifeguard and they told him well you just volunteered for naval combat demolition which he'd never heard of rigorous training they were calling it hell week even back then which of course is now legendary among the navy seals running in the soft sand and long distance swimming and wading through the mangrove swamps well, the last day of Hell Week back then was uh, live fire exercises to see if the men would flinch and make sure that they could could handle combat demolition. And so, yeah, that was his training. And then after you know serving at Omaha Beach, he deployed to the Pacific with Draper Kaufman's underwater demolition teams. I was going to ask about D-Day. In my mind, D-Day for a naval diver in these recon units would be at, uh, you know, Midnight, you sneak in, you you dispose of all the bomb demolition stuff. You know, you do your thing on the beach and you creep back out. And at dawn, the troops go in. But that's that's not at all what happens, is it? Right. So the NCBUs at D-Day, they were led by two officers who had no prior naval combat demolition experience. And some of the more junior officers who'd gone through Draper's training at Fort Pierce they said, we need to deploy ahead of the landing troops to clear these obstacles in order to avoid infantry hiding behind the obstacles and hampering our demolition. But the senior brass didn't want to compromise the element of surprise. So they said, no, we're going to send them in with the infantry. That problem arose across the beaches as, you know, infantry were, were hiding behind the obstacles or tragically instances of friendly fire and stymied their demolition efforts on Omaha beach. So the, by the time they got to the Pacific, the, the UDTs were deploying in swim trunks a day or sometimes days ahead of the landing forces so they can work unhindered, which of course is terrifying being the first to swim into an enemy beach, but they were able to use the, use the ocean and their training to dive under enemy fire. But, in uh, Normandy, they were going in with with the landing troops. What happens to them? Uh, you know, once they go in, in theory, once the, once the beaches are secured, do they have a mission beyond that, or is their responsibility literally in the surf? And and once the beach is secured, that's it. They're not retasked in Normandy. At Normandy, they were continuing to clear obstacles and widen their gaps. They were they were allotted gaps through the obstacles to allow our landing boats and, and tanks and jeeps to roll through. And so for a week after they were they were widening those gaps. But no, they weren't going further inland. And and the same in the UDTs that their responsibility was up to the dune line. I was going to ask about uh George uh Morton, you know He's, you would have thought D-Day would be enough for somebody <laughs> uh, in Europe uh, and then being sent to the Pacific. I know my, my dad, after being serving in North, uh, Northwest Europe, was told he was going to the Pacific and I think he, he was, oh, oh, I don't want to go. And thank, thankfully the war ended before he had... He, he, uh, 
he had to go. But what when when they ship from the European theatre to the Pacific, is there an element of retraining? Do they are they is is the way they operate different? Do they have to do different things? Uh, what is what they face different? Do they have to? Is it a completely different doctrine? Yeah. So in this case, he was moving from NCDU into UDT. So there's some brief UDT training at Fort Pierce again. And then they did their advanced training on Maui. And, and Draper Kaufman was lead instructor at the, UD, at the UDT Maui base. They were spending most of their time in the ocean, learning stealth swimming, you know, using the breaststroke and the side stroke to avoid breaking the surface of the water. Brought in a Hawaiian pearl diver as a guest instructor to teach them and to hold their breath longer, to dive under enemy bullets, and stay concealed for longer. Practicing that the pickup that I write about my in my book, you know, where they are hooking their arm through a rope ring, and you better you better explain that because that's just incredible. Because they don't they don't stop to pick them up when they're swimming back, do they? They, they? That's deemed as a right. So the the first mission I mentioned, the Draper led at Saipan, the boats did come to a standstill and haul the men out of the water, and of course that draws heavy enemy fire. They're sitting ducks. So that needed to be fixed. And at Maui, they started experimenting with pickup at high speed. So after their swim mission, scouting the shore, the, the swimmers would line up in the water. Then you'd have the landing craft coming down the line with a rubber raft attached to the side. And there'd be two men in the rubber raft. One was holding this uh, steel cord rope ring. And the, uh, both were called catchers. So each man would hook his arm through the ring, the boat's momentum would pull him out of the water. And then the second man in the raft, the catcher would tug him in. Um, and then they'd crawl over the gunnel into the landing craft. So all of that was done just so that they didn't have to come to a stop. And and it was effective. And they used it not, not only for the rest of the war, but I've talked to a couple Korean War frogmen who were using that same tactic. That, that's a point. Um, you know, it's easy to think they're not using scuba gear, are they? Because you, you, you sort of, I don't know where they went to. to I mean, this is a complete side. Where did the term frogman come from? So there are a few different stories on that. And the, the one that I put in my book that um, was that uh, a newspaper man saw a few UDT guys with their masks holding their swim fins. And I, you know, he couldn't write what they did for the Navy because they were a top secret unit. But he referred to them as frogmen. So that's one version. But you do see the term frogman in, you know, World War II correspondences, like in writing about Iwo Jima, one of the guys on the gunboat had said, you know, these frogmen went in first. So it, it was that was the first usage of that term, which, of course, now is, is uh, synonymous with the Navy SEALs. We're not talking scuba gear, are we? This hasn't been invented. We're not talking underwater breathing apparatus. So what do they equip with? Yeah, the scuba, the scuba gear... It was very primitive during World War II. The U.S. had another combat swim unit called the OSS Maritime Unit, and they were experimenting with this early scuba gear. I got fascinated in that. It didn't make not much of it made it into the book, but they had a base on Catalina Island, and those were some of the, the first people using scuba in the ocean. That was a predecessor of the CIA, our OSS. And they were training in a lot of, you know, not just demolition, but assault tactics, you know, using waterproof uh, machine guns and ordnance and mini submersibles. So and and some of this early scuba equipment, the Jack Brown lung and the aqua lung, which had come out of Jacques Cousteau in France, um, was inventor of that. But the, the UDTs, eventually Draper decided that It'll slow us down in the water, and really there's no match for just a well-trained swimmer hand-placing a charge. He did experiment with some drone boats, and I get into that in the book. At Saipan, he used these motorized rubber rafts, and those turned out to be a disaster. So it's really just a low-tech um, solution that they decided on. I think what comes across as well is they, this is all new. The unit doesn't exist. The, the, whole, doc, the whole doctrine doesn't exist. And they have to invent it as they go. So they keep trying things. It's like the masks. Now, the, the, the masks were not easily readily available, are they? Just regular diving masks, which you think will be everywhere because you've seen that 
every beach for sale. Yeah, yeah, that that was one of the little surprises because they are so ubiquitous now. But back then they were really only used by spear fishermen, which was a really niche sport. Manufactured in LA, you know, I I, I always get was fa- fascinated by my hometown connections, but by a, a local swim champion. I'm sorry, not the masks, the fins, um, Churchill fins, they're called, which are still the most popular fins for body surfers. And he'd been over in Tahiti seeing uh, native teenagers diving with uh, with rubber crate fins, got a license to manufacture them in the U.S. and didn't have many sales before the war, but by the end of the war, they were selling gangbusters. Popping out thousands. Nothing like a military contract to make a fortune. Right, right. But it was all very early primitive equipment, so much so that I, George, I remember telling me, would would cut his fins and his mask because it was so uncomfortable. So he'd have to kind of tweak the rubber to fit his face. So there was a lot of tinkering, which I, I loved about this in Maui, too, that Draper would invite ideas from the men, from the enlisted men. You know, it wasn't a top down thing. It was take a good idea from wherever it comes. So an enlisted guy came up with the the floating reel of fishing line, which they used to measure the ocean depth, dropping a a weighted fishing line to the bottom and having unique knots to to judge the depth. You know, a lot of innovations, they used a a condom to to waterproof their fuses and a lot of experimentation. And I write in the book that they were the perfect men for it as children of the depression. You know, they knew how to make things work and how how to survive. Make do amend. Now, George Morton takes part in the landings at Iwo Jima. Now, I'm so, so fascinated. You, you sort of hinted about it, but they were taking uh, depth readings and they don't go in with, they are actually sent in as recon before the operation, the invasion starts. So what what are they doing? Because it's quite fascinating what they're actually doing. They, they, it is quite detailed what they do, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Iwo Jima, I, I spent a lot of time on, on researching that. And what what they were assigned to do is to scout the eastern beach approaches because those were closest to Motoyama Airfield Number 1, which was the Marines' primary objective. problem with the eastern beaches was they worried that the underwater incline would be too steep and cause all our landing craft to shipwreck. So it fell to these... UDT swimmers to deploy ahead of the Marines and measure that underwater incline to see if it would be prohibitively steep. So just like we described, they were riding up in landing crafts and they were kind of hoping that the Japanese would save their fire for the main invasion. The problem was that their fire support boats, these gunboats, they came in like a invasion wave instead of staggered and their silhouettes were landing craft silhouettes because they'd been retrofitted from Europe as gunboats. So in short, the Japanese thought this is the Marine invasion and opened fire on these gunboats. And it's one of the the famous gunboat battles of of World War II. Uh, Meanwhile, the swimmers were in the water doing their job, drawing a lot of this fire. And they measured the underwater incline, decided it it wasn't prohibitively steep and that the Marines could land there. There were a lot of shipwrecks come landing day, but they put a lot of Marines ashore. So it was the right choice. And they say that the main asset was drawing this heavy enemy fire allowed us to locate these gun emplacements along the coast of Iwo Jima and put a lot of them out of commission. Of course, there were miles and miles of tunnels under Iwo Jima that you couldn't touch. And, and then that's why it became a, such a bloody battle, but it was a UDT success. Uh, you alluded it to there, but they, they, they're not a, a, a small unit zipping about in little boats. They do actually have a, a, is it a flotilla, a small fleet of, of support vessels that they can call in fire support if necessary, necessary to su- suppress shorter ship fire, haven't they? Right. And that, that was a big part of this UDT strategy. So when it was first introduced to Draper Kaufman, by the inventor of the UDTs, Kelly Turner, Draper said a a daylight reconnaissance. You know, he thought they'd be ordered to do it at night in stealth. And Draper said, you know, this is going to be a suicide mission. Turner's rationale was we're going to have a lot of fire support for you. So behind the swimmers were, you know, a line of gunboats, a line of destroyers, line of battleships just lobbing fire onto the onto the coast 
time to the swimmer's mission because some of them, you know, they'd be going ashore uh, to keep the Japanese pinned down while the swimmers were in the water. So that was crucial to the fact that they didn't incur mass casualties. And by Okinawa, they had that gunfire support down to a science. And, you know, so much so that the, the Japanese just ceded the beach to the Americans and we landed unopposed. I find it incredible that they, they uh, pre-invasion, they give so much weight to these swimmers. They actually give them a whole raft of <laughs> ships under their control. And and yet you never necessarily hear about these operations. Uh, yet, yet clearly at the time they were seen as being crucial to say, look, here's a big part of our combat unit that they're, they're there to protect you. However many guys, how many guys take part at Iwu? The largest mission, it was at Okinawa, a thousand swimmers and teams. Iwo Jima was smaller, probably 200 swimmers on that, on that Eastern Beach reconnaissance mission. And they also did some scouting on the Western Beach. And, and, and there they were helped clearing beach obstacles as well, including that pileup I mentioned of the, the landing craft. They had to blow up those plywood boats to to keep troops coming ashore. That was another, I wrote in as a character, Squeaky Anderson, who was the beach master, who was tasked to keep, keep the troops coming. And I love this, these stories of just the working guys, you know, I write a little bit about the CBs in this. And I, I think of the UDT, you know, it wasn't especially glamorous. It was just facilitating these amphibious assaults. And the reason you didn't hear about them is because they were top secret. Draper was approached by a lot of uh, newspaper men who wanted to tell the stories of the, you know, the Navy's elite swimmers, but he didn't want to risk the Japanese developing a countermeasure, which would have been easy. You think just plant mines on the ocean floor and could have taken all our swimmers out of commission as soon as they went in the water. So to avoid that, he said no stories. But the unfortunate consequence is that they came home and. People had never heard of the UDTs. They'd say, is that like the Marines or the Navy? So they really never, they missed out on that wave of publicity that more famous units of World War II received. And to this day, you know, people still outside military circles aren't that familiar with these, with these swimmers. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. I'm talking to Andrew Dubbins about U.S. Navy demolition divers. Do we know uh, on you know like Iwo Jima? Do we know once they've gathered gathered information, they they how is it processed and and does it did it ever make a, a direct difference? I mean, are they processing information fast enough? Because you know, now we'd be going, oh, there'll be a, you know, there'll be a set of text and a digital photograph and this that and the other, and there's a lot of ways you can process information very quickly back back to the commanders. But I'm guessing these guys are. Can they process information fast enough to make a difference to the operation that is going to be happening within days, hours? They did, yeah. So I mentioned the the fishing line, for instance, to measure the water depth. They would scribble that onto a little plexiglass slate tied on their uh, knee, or sometimes they wore it around their around their necks. Hand in their slate at the end of the swim mission to the commander. The commander would uh, would write those down present it to the cartographer on the command ship. And he turn all those numbers into depth measurements and create a nautical chart of the beach approach. And Draper was insistent, we want to get these nautical charts in the hands of the Marine commanders on a day before the mission. They use that all the way up to Okinawa. And they also would have an officer who had led the swim mission either presenting the information to the Marines are often leading them in a lead boat ashore to, to, you know, show them the way in a couple of times the Draper had to do it and um, was leading amphibious tanks, you know, in a, in an Amtrak. And uh, so, yeah, they, they made use of this information. Another point at Iwo Jima is they were tasked to retrieve a sample of the sand, the black volcanic sand, because there were concerns that, our wheeled vehicles might sink in the sand. And this was a error that Draper admitted. They were fingering through the sand and Draper said, I'm no expert on sand. I, I don't know. And the Marine said, well, we think it's going to be coarse enough to accommodate our wheeled vehicles. So he fired off the message that, you know, the sand should be fine. Lo and behold, 
wheeled vehicles require fine sand and not coarse sand. So you had our jeeps sinking in this volcanic sand and piling up on the beach, and you took a lot of flack for that. Uh, but the the intelligence they collected was absolutely used, and that's why they were you know, <laughs> continue to be used for every island assault. Is it that there's a whole unit you don't hear of naval cartographers? I'm not sure it'll be a page turning novel, but uh, <laughs> but. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating, perhaps short paper on the, uh, you know, what, what the hell did they do? So when when these guys are on a ship, I mean, when they're not on missions and they're, uh, you know, they go from Iwo Jima, then the next at uh, 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 Okinawa, when they're not on missions, are they part of the regular ship's company or do they have literally nothing to do? That's kind of humorous. <laughs> so as George described it, they did have, you know, like battle station assignments if the ship comes under an attack, an air or sea attack. They have to man guns that are on the boat. That said, that was maybe a few days of training early in the voyage. And the rest of the time, they had no official shipboard responsibilities. So while you had the Navy crew, you know, swabbing the decks and cleaning the latrines, they were just kind of wandering around in their swim trunks and smoking cigarettes. And the, and, they, and they they took some um, teasing from the Navy, George said that we were called uh, undesirable tourists, UDTs, you know, because they're just, they have a lot of downtime. So George said he'd read and hang out with his buddies, but yeah, until their, until their missions, they just had time to kill. Did they face any, I mean, Okinawa is famous for its, uh, for the, the, the kamikaze attacks. Did they, did he, did, did George ever have to operate as a, a anti-aircraft gunner? He did. Yeah. And I write about that off Okinawa, um, the, and there were a lot of close calls. You think these UDT transports were transporting all of their explosives below deck. So just, you know, one hit from a, a kamikaze or a torpedo, and that would have just decimated the ship. And I write Hapi Wajima about the USS Blessman, where uh, they were attacked by a, a Betty bomber and and it got very close to to the explosives below decks, but they were able to fight the fire. And Draper came into the rescue and kind of turned his ship into a firefighting ship to to get it out. Um, and a lot of close calls off off Okinawa too. They, they carry a tremendous amount of explosives. These guys were uh, looking around with them. They're kind of like I don't know. And and then there's a there's a picture in the book of the with a with a sort of a satchel of of explosives. You're thinking. I looked at it and I thought, that's a really big satchel of explosives. <laughs> We're not talking like hand grenades. These are big bricks of explosives they're looking around. <laughs> I know. I think they were swimming with those on their back, you know, and that's why these guys were, were so fit. You know, George described it. We were a bunch of skinny teenagers off the street. You know, they're not the muscle-bound seals of today. But all that swimming, they were in they were in great shape. I, I remember reading one anecdote that some guys would, you know, spin a hole in their hands to keep their hand muscles fit for these missions. And that was interesting to me too, is that they, they do calisthenics on the deck because they didn't, you know, want to atrophy and before their missions and even diving into the open ocean and route to their missions to um it's it was an athletic job for sure. I remember this correctly. They're expected to swim from the boat. How far were they dropped off to swim to shore? It was quite. It was, I was quite surprised at the distance, considering it was open sea. At Saipan, that became kind of a joke that the Draper said, "I want them to be able to swim a mile." And it was pointed out to him, "Well, it's a mile there, but it's going to be another mile back." And he said, "Well, if they can muster the the strength to get in, they're gonna they're gonna be able to get back." So, I, I, but it varied depending on the location of the reef. You know, often they'd be dropping them off at the edge of the reef. That's the underwater terrain they'd want to scout to avoid the disaster of Tarawa, Tarawa, which is where all this started. You know, where our marine landing boats got stuck on on the shallow reef at neap tide, and the Marines had to wade ashore and suffer terrible losses. That's the battle where Richmond Kelly Turner. 
said, we need to deploy specialists ahead of the landing forces to clear the underwater obstacles and scout the terrain. And that was the birth of the UDTs. A lot of people credit Draper as the creator of the UDTs, but even he acknowledged Kelly Turner as the real inventor. Um, And he's rightly so considered the father and helped shape the tactics and commanded a lot of these early missions. Oh, you mentioned there's like, up to a thousand, was it a thousand, thousand dry, dry swimmers at Okinawa. Was that a particularly difficult mission for them or is it fairly straightforward? The difficulty at Okinawa is that the Japanese had lined the beaches with these sharpened stakes, all in an effort to stab the holes of our landing craft. Um, so those needed to be cleared. So it was a big demolition mission. Unlike at Iwo Jima, where, where no real underwater obstacles or coastal defenses were found, Okinawa had had all these stakes. Some had barbed wire topped with mines. So we had to deploy ahead, swim ashore, and rig these to blow. And uh, Draper oversaw that mission. And it was a success, but for one sector which didn't blow and he had to send the team back the next day his motto is always let's overdo the explosives because we don't have to want to have to come back and in that instance they really did and uh, blew up all these posts and you think about all of our you know at omaha beach uh, the pile up of men and boats behind the german obstacles it, it was a real essential act at, at okinawa George Morton. I mean, I, I keep I keep telling people about George Morton's story because I just can't believe he went through so many landings. You'd have thought Okinawa after Iwo Jima and and D Day uh, Omaha would be enough, but he's then to, to Borneo. Now they swim in pairs in buddies. Had he had the same buddy since D D Day? Had he gone through? Yeah, yeah, and. Tragically lost his his buddy at uh, at Borneo in um, what he always thought might have been a misfired uh, American shell friendly fire, and never really could get to the bottom of of whether it had come from us or come from them because he was uh, injured in that same hit and you know barely managed to get back to his landing craft and then spent some time on the hospital ship. But yeah, Borneo was the last major UDT operation of the war. Um, a lot of people thought it ended at Okinawa. The picture of Okinawa is the big last climactic battle, but the the final UDT initiative was at was at uh, Borneo. He's one of those people who manages to put a pin in places, uh, important places. He finds himself in Tokyo Harbor for the surrender. So, what are the teams doing in Tokyo Harbor for the surrender? Yeah, so the atomic bomb, of course, bombs made the invasion of Japan, Operation Olympic, unnecessary. But we still needed to um, occupy occupation duty. And the UDTs were looked to to help scout the way for our occupation forces to go aboard battleships and clear demolition and check these landing places for mines and so he found himself at uh, Yokosuka Naval Base, just outside Tokyo, going through the base and and checking for any suicide boats. That was another concern that they might uh, try to retaliate and have you know rogue units coming after our ships in the harbor. Um, and did find some suicide boats. Draper found a lot of these uh, suicide torpedoes and suicide boats, so we were blowing those up. So yeah, they were continuing to work even after the surrender and then the famous surrender ceremony. They even had a few jobs that day. I read about one UDT man who was in the water, you know, scouting for craft and they were looking under the hole of the Missouri, make sure there were no lines with all of our brass on that ship. It's just incredible where they've managed to get themselves to. It's it's that classic story of, uh, uh, if it if it wasn't true, if it was written as fiction, you'd just think you'd think it was just unbelievable. <laughs> I, I mean, I just I was shocked in researching the UDTs that I just hadn't heard anything about them because it's uh, just all top secret and and they really 
they were the first into these places. And you think about the courage that took these young guys, you know, late teens, early 20s. And that was by design. Draper didn't want anyone over 35 because he wanted, you know, young, energetic and and fit men who could, you know, you know, think running over soft sand and climbing up. Um, they're swimming with the the packs of explosives on their back. It took young guys who could do that. These, these teams, is there a line between these teams and the modern uh, SEALs you, you, uh, now? Is that what they morph into or, or, or have, they, have they now become a separate unit? So the, the SEALs came about, um, their first major deployments were in Vietnam as the men with green faces. And they drew from a lot of these elite units of World War II. I don't want to say it was only the underwater demolition teams, but certainly borrowed a lot of uh, these, you know, stealth swim tactics the SEALs still practice, underwater demolition, you know, these secret deployments. So a lot of the traditions of the UDTs. One little interesting detail is that the SEALs still call themselves the teams, which is a nod to the underwater demolition teams. A lot of the old guards still know Drapers, the grandpappy bullfrog. So there's definitely the, the through line. But they were also borrowing from that maritime unit that I mentioned, the OSS maritime unit, you know, and other elite units of World War II. So what happens to uh, Dripper Kaufman and uh, George Morton after the war? Do they stay in the Navy? Uh, so that was interesting that they met on the way home from Japan and, and Draper was, he was inviting you know, enlisted men to apply to Annapolis. He'd gone to Annapolis and, uh, you know, he'd had to get the congressional appointment, but they also have these fleet appointments, which allow, you know, men who serve to matriculate into Annapolis. But George hadn't given a lot of thought to what he wanted to do after the war. And he decided, you know, why not? He met Draper and got interviewed and, and he was home on leave preparing to go to Annapolis. Draper gave him that fleet appointment when he started having these fainting spells, didn't know that, you know, he couldn't get to the bottom of what it was, sent him to the psychiatric ward. And it's consistent with PTSD symptoms, which they didn't know about back then. But, you know, his experiences in the war it just it continue to haunt him to this day. Even in my interviewing him, he, he'd have nightmares. He says, sometimes I'm recalling things that I've been long trying to forget. And uh, it was really difficult for him to recall his story even some 80 years later. But in, the short answer is he he got into the food industry and eventually started his own business, which I was always struck by the fact he started riding groceries around New Jersey as a little kid and, and then started his own big food distribution business. Um, had a family and two kids and decent health, but suffers a um, some some breathing issues, and so it was difficult during the pandemic. Um, I wanted to be sensitive to to his health, of course. And Draper, Draper, um, he ended up living his boyhood dream, commanding a destroyer, but always stayed on the the vanguard of warfare. Volunteered in those bikini nuclear tests to test the water, make sure it was safe for our guys to go in, which spoke to his pacifistic. You know, he had written to his dad that. If he could be more useful, saving life rather than taking it, that was his preference. And that was a through line throughout his career with the UDT and defusing bombs in the UK and driving an ambulance, which I always thought was neat. And, you know, checking the water after after our nuclear blast and then became an um, administrator at Annapolis, mentor a lot of African-American officers, was ahead of his time in that respect. And then died of died of a heart attack, like his dad. I, I half expected when I got to the end of the book for you to relieve that uh, reveal that Drip was asked to leave the navy because of his eyesight. <laughs> it was almost I don't mean a relief, but you know, yeah, it was it was it was kind of pleasant surprise, I should say, that they actually managed to stay in and, and uh, work work his way up because there's that whole thing, isn't it, where he he couldn't be promoted because for a long time he seemed to be. He was only a lieutenant, a uh, lieutenant from American, a lieutenant because he was um, not in the regular Navy. And I, he was in the re Naval Reserve and that, that capped his, his where he could be as a commissioned officer. Is that, have I got that right? I don't know that it capped where he could be, but his dad, you know, who's of course this 
admiral. He thought Draper could be doing more for his career. He said, you got to come over to Pearl Harbor more. His dad was, you know, commanding destroyers out of Pearl Harbor and got to start networking with the the brass over here and kind of advance your stagnant career, which was always kind of ironic in my mind because Draper, it's just his career was just on the cutting edge and he was in the process of pioneering the Navy SEALs. But from a rank perspective and the old guard Navy perspective, you know, he was still just a junior officer. And Draper, he did some of that. He volunteered, he was not volunteered, he was served on, uh, on Kelly Turner's staff, but he wanted to be out leading the teams and he was a lot more hands on. He didn't want to be cooped up behind a desk at Pearl Harbor. I don't sure I have much else, but how on earth did you manage to dig up, uh, dig up? That sounds, that sounds awful. Uh, how did you manage to find George, George Morton? I mean, what a, what a catch to discover someone. Yeah, my first, uh, kind of discovery of the UDTs was at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, which I highly recommend um, just for any World War II buffs. It's, I was walking through an exhibit on the Pacific Theater and I saw the swim fin behind the glass display case and it struck me as so out of place, you know, surrounded by weapons and ammunition and model yeah. warships. So I read the description and belonged to the underwater demolition teams of World War II. Had never heard of them, so I penciled it down as something I might like to research further. And somebody advised me, you know, when it came time that I wanted to write a book, pick something you're really going to want to dive into for two years because it takes that long. And uh, and I decided to look in the UDTs, started doing some researching, and sadly, a lot of them have passed away, but found his oral history on the National World War II Museum. Difficult to track down with a very generic name and George Morgan, but managed to in Arizona and, and that well, set it well, off. well done on uh, tracking down George. Andrew, we'll we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Loyal listener, if you want to know the full story of the US Navy combat swimmers and Draper Kaufman and George Morton, the book to pick up is Into Enemy Waters, a World War Two story of the demolition divers who became the Navy SEALs. As ever, I will put a link in the show notes and on the website. Now, if you have enjoyed this uh, episode of the podcast, why not become a patron? You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. For patrons, Patreon will give you a custom RSS feed to use with your podcast software of choice, which can use to get extra World War chat and advert-free episodes magically appearing on your device. So that is patreon.com slash ww2podcast. And it's a big thank you to those loyal listeners who do already support the show. Well, that is all for me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88mm gun hit our tongue and blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.